Hey, this is Blonde Guy Gamer, and welcome to the start of something I've been wanting to try my hand at for quite some time. Top 10 videos. And, uh, I'm doing this because, you know, 10 fingers, top 10. Not just to be flashy with my hands, even though I just said earlier, try my hand at this, so this became an initial hand pun. Eh. And while I am a little late, I figured we'd start with something simple. My top 10 games of 2017. Really? A little late, my ass! If you're gonna rip off other people doing top 10s, you could have at least made yours on time and not months later. <sighs> yes, I am aware of that, but I do have my reasons. One of those being that 2017 was definitely a substantial year for gaming, so naturally a lot of noteworthy games came out. And because of that, I do have a couple of disclaimers for my top 10 list. For one, my entries are for 2017 games that I got that year and I didn't even start playing some of them until near or after the end of the year, so that's one of the reasons why this is as late as it is. Another thing to keep in mind is that this is a personal list of games I've played, so if some of your favorites aren't here, chances are it's simply because I do know those are good games too. It's just that I didn't get around to getting them last year, like Nier Automata or Sonic Mania just to name a couple I still don't have for now, but will get eventually. So with all that, let's not delay this any further and start, shall we? Honorable Mention yeah, I know I just said let's not delay, but before we get to the numbered entries, I do want to bring up a honorable mention that didn't quite make the list. That being the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy. Since this is a remaster of three games, it would be hard to justify a spot in the list. I do want to briefly talk about it since while I do own the original PlayStation Crash Bandicoot games, I never got around to fully play through them. So with the release of the Insane Trilogy, I figured I'd finally have a real go at them with this and I'm glad I did. The redone visuals are a treat, and it retains the fun platforming of the originals. Of course, diehard fans of the originals have pointed out the differences, for better or worse. And yeah, things like the jet ski not controlling great and warped I understand, but the pill-shaped hitbox on the feet that makes certain platforms in Crash 1 unnecessarily harder... I found wasn't that much of a problem. It totally is, though! I'll just say this, that issue is easily outweighed by the improvements made for the first Crash Bandicoot. Actually being able to conveniently save the game in this version is worth it alone. Too bad that won't stop the Dark Soul comparison because anything that presents a hearty challenge will automatically be equated to that. Thanks, gaming culture. Besides, only the Stormy Ascent Lost level really reaches those levels of difficulty anyway. And with this now coming to the Switch, if you haven't played any of the Crash games before or want great remasters of the original trilogy, then I definitely recommend it. Oh yeah, Spyro the Dragon is also getting a remastered trilogy, and I've been meaning to play those games too. Guess I'm doing the same thing for Spyro this year. Alright, now we can get to the top 10, starting with... Number 10, Yooka Laylee. Really? Yooka Laylee? That game did not live up to the Kickstarter hype. You and the completionists are like the only ones that put this in a top 2017 game list. I'm not even going to watch the rest of this video because I'm sure the rest of your choices will be just as bad. Goodbye! Well, at least we don't have to worry about him anymore. So yeah, this is certainly the most divisive entry on this list, but I actually did enjoy Ukulele just enough to get in my top 10. Also, I did do a kickback review on this game if you want a slightly more in-depth opinion. With this being a collectathon style 3D platformer headed by the original developers of Banjo Kazooie, it did appeal to me as a Banjo Kazooie fan. The similarities are very apparent. Perhaps a bit too apparent for some, as keeping it close to Banjo Kazooie also meant keeping much of the design mentality of those older games, which kind of turned some people off. I still like the aspect of satisfying collecting and the creativity beyond each world's challenges based off of the Chameleon Bat Duo's abilities. Yet with the double-edged sword of having that many tasks being that not every page is as fun as others. For the most part, I didn't mind these quirks, though there are still a few that did get to me, which is why this game sits at number 10. An update has addressed issues since its initial release, of which I did notice some improvements in this replay, while others like in the clunky market levels are still present. However, if you are willing to tolerate the occasional inconsistencies at least as much as I did, you have a charming 3D platformer with nice visuals and music as a whole. I know that won't convince everyone, but that's where I stand on this game, whether you like it or not. Number 9. A Hat in Time. Oh look, another kickstarted indie 3 platforming harking back to collectathon roots. Except the majority of people liked it. 
Yeah, I'll admit, from what I've played so far of A Hat in Time, its qualities are more consistent than ukuleles, so it's not really going to surprise anyone that this is on a higher spot. I was going to make a kickback on this game too, and I may still do, being late is just kind of my thing I guess, but in the meantime I may as well quickly bring it up here. Developed by Gears from Refus, A Hat in Time stars the ever adorable girl Hat Kid retrieving time hourglasses that fuel her starship so she can go back home. The structure is heavily inspired by 3D Mario games, the most obvious being Super Mario Sunshine, though it doesn't rely entirely on those design aspects. Each world is played in chapters to get hourglasses, but the real enjoyment comes from all the silly character interactions and charm that this game has. Exploration has its merits too, with materials you find to make new hats with abilities and being able to purchase badges for even more skills. I still need to fully play through this game, but it has been a treat and I will definitely play more. I mean, what other 3D platformer has you solve a murder mystery on a train and be able to play a complete Corgi Texas adventure game within the hub world ship? Also, did I mention how freaking adorable Hat Kid is? Because she really is. Number 8. Little Nightmares. Well, this'll be a tunnel shift after a hat in time, that's for sure. Little Nightmares is a pretty unique survival horror game in that it's a puzzle platformer. You play as a girl in a yellow raincoat named Six, trying to make her way through a large vessel simply known as the Maw. With only a lighter at the ready, Six will need to solve some physics-based puzzles and slip past some rather disturbing creatures and residents of the Maw. And if that wasn't enough, at certain points Six will suddenly be succumbed by ravenous hunger, and let's just say the means to satisfy become more gruesome as the game goes on. What strikes me the most is the dark vintage art style, with an unsettling tall perspective looming over everything to make you feel real small and helpless in this mysterious vessel. The sound is on point too, bringing the atmosphere to a halt, whether it's the ambience or chase music kicking in when you're spotted. The only major problem with Little Nightmares is that it's pretty short, although there are a few collectibles and DLC chapters following a boy in his own adventure through the Maw, the last of which haven't been released not too long ago and there is a complete edition with those included. Despite the game not being very lengthy, it was still a memorable experience and a solid recommendation for a creepy game to play. Number 7. Tales of Berseria Considering that I am a fan of the series and doing a retrospective, I would unsurprisingly get the latest Tales of entry. However, I actually didn't start playing it until somewhat recently for this video, partly due to wanting to go through the rest of the series first. But since my cutoff in the retrospective is Cesteria, the previous Tales game, I figured I should just play some of this and get some thoughts now because who knows how long it'll be before I finish the other games and talk about Berseria on its own. I can safely say that Berseria keeps up with the series standards of quality and is my JRPG of 2017. If only because I haven't played Persona 5 yet. I know, that's what everyone else's JRPG of the year was. Or maybe Xenoblade Chronicles 2. And I do want to get those someday too. But let's not forget Berseria came out earlier that year and gave it some time in the spotlight, shall we? You play as Velvet, a young woman with a possessed arm that feeds off of other monsters. As edgy as she comes across, I actually really like this game's protagonist, if only because her motivation for revenge is, shall we say, justifiable. I won't spoil why or any other story elements here, but you'll know what I mean if you play it yourself. As for the gameplay, advancements to the Modern Tales formula have been made, most notably in the battle system. Fights are the fastest and most fluid they've been yet, with the four face buttons stringing together attacks using a soul gauge meter. This can also lead into powerful break souls attacks with the right trigger for even more devastating combos. And then there's the blast gauges where a full three point meter uses a character's flashy mystic art. Or in what is actually a mechanic I wasn't expecting in a Tales game, using blast points to swap in reserve characters into battle. I haven't seen something like that since Final Fantasy X. The fights can seem a little button mashy at first, but once you get a grasp on setting up arts with the systems at place, they are quite engaging. The areas and progression so far are a little straightforward, though that is likely due to playing through the early stages of the game. There's still a lot of loot and things to find and upgrade, like skills you master through equipment or weapon customization with gathered materials. The party of characters in Basuri is another thing I like too. Even the more eccentric characters like Magilu I didn't find annoying and actually had some funny moments between them all. The character interaction and cutscenes and skits are always a treat, and in Berseria it's no exception with great voice acting at work. Especially from Christina Villa's Velvet. The same voice actress you may associate more with upbeat roles like Shantae really shows her talent in voicing the rugged and determined Velvet. So to sum things up, I have enjoyed what I've played of Tales of Berseria and will add it to my list of games I need to finish. My 
long list of games I need to finish. Maybe once I do, I'll make a full review on the game. We'll see. Until then, this makes me glad to be a Tales fan. I wish I had power like that. I'd forget about it if I were you. Number 6. Cuphead. Now this was a game that intrigued everyone when it was first revealed a few years ago. A indie game traditionally animated in a 1930s cartoon style is nothing short of ambitious. And it turned out to be a run and gun style game similar to the likes of Contra or Gunstar Heroes. Needless to say, people were on board for this, myself included. Following the story of Cuphead and his brother Mugman, they kinda sell their souls to the devil and in pleading to not take them, the Cup Brothers are then tasked to take soul contracts from various citizens of the Inkwell Islands. Of course, they won't be easy to get as everyone with a contract will put up a fight. And fight they will. There are a few run and gun levels to simply get to the end, but about 75% of the game are the boss fights and they are a spectacle to say the least. The art and animation is phenomenal, replicating the trippy and crazy things that can happen in old cartoons leading to some very creative phases for bosses to pull off. The difficulty of the game is a well-known topic, since this was made with a retro challenge in mind, yet it's not a detriment to the game. You will die a lot, but that's part of the experience. Seeing how close you get to defeating a boss and giving you that persistence of continuously trying until you learn how to effectively avoid their attacks and finally pull it off. Add some catchy jazz music, delightful overworlds of the islands to navigate, and a handful of shot types, charms, and super moves to get, and you have one hell of an indie game. And I don't mean that just because it has the devil in it. Just don't expect a relaxing time with this game. It can get intense, especially with two players. Studio MDMR did a fantastic job with blowing off the concept alone, and I eagerly wait to see if they do make a sequel or whatever else is next. Here's hoping. Number 5. Metroid Samus Returns Note, I don't have a means to record 3DS games, so I had to resort to game trailers and gameplay videos. Sorry about that. I think I speak for most Metroid fans that I'm both really glad and really relieved we got this. Because since Metroid Other M, there had been skepticism for the franchise's future, and Federation Force was not something fans wanted at that time. So when Metroid Prime 4 got announced, not only were we getting that sometime in the future, but also a remake of Metroid 2 for the 3DS later that year. That's one way to bring Metroid back, and would also explain why AM2R got cease and desist. The game was developed by Mercury's team, who before did the Castlevania Lords of Shadow games. Knowing that, people did approach this with caution, particularly because Mirror of Fate was a Metroidvania-style game that not a whole lot of people liked. I personally didn't think it was that bad, but that's a topic for another potential video. Despite that reputation, Mercury's team, under the supervision of Nintendo, pulled off not only a good remake, but a good Metroid game overall. The staple of exploring to find upgrades in order to access new areas is still here, of course, along with Metroid 2's objective of hunting down all the nefarious Metroids in their progressively dangerous forms. There are some new features to entice this revisit to SR388, like precision aiming and being able to parry attacking enemies when they flash. While the game heavily relies on this mechanic, it is satisfying to pull off, especially on the advanced Metroids giving you gratifying scenes of Samus kicking ass. There's also a few new power-ups in the form of the Aeon abilities, such as a pulse that reveals portions of the map. That was a nice take on both navigation and secret finding. Samus Returns was pretty much what I wanted in a new 2D Metroid, in that it has familiarity of a classic Metroid game while throwing in some neat new things and twists on old conventions. It makes the anticipation for Metroid Prime 4 all the more sweeter knowing that Samus has indeed returned. Number 4. Resident Evil 7 Biohazard Speaking of revitalized franchises, after jumping the shark a few too many times in the overblow mess that was Resident Evil 6, Capcom knew they had to go back to a more focused survival horror experience. So with Resident Evil 7, they did just that. As Ethan, you'll enter a Louisiana estate looking for his wife, only to run into the crazed Baker family and the horrors that lurk within. As the first main entry in a first-person view, it pulls it off well with having some conventions from modern survival horror games combined with aspects of the Resident Evil series. It looks great and runs at 60fps even on a regular PS4, and while I don't have a VR headset, I heard that works pretty well for something that is an included feature. There isn't much variety in enemies, but the ones that are here are well designed, and the boss fights are some of the most memorable the series has have. 
Even then, there is a nice balance of dangerous encounters, exploration to find items you'll need to manage, and puzzle solving that the series is known for. Not to mention it can actually be a little scary at times. I enjoyed the main game quite a bit, though I haven't really bothered with the DLC, outside of the free Not A Hero one. I'll probably only get End of Zoe later, but if you haven't played 7 yet, there is a gold edition that includes all of the DLC. Still, on its own, Resident Evil 7 is a visceral survival horror game that takes the series back in a right direction. <laughs> Number 3. Horizon Zero Dawn With the amount of series entries, spiritual successors, and games taking inspiration so far on this list, I think it's about time we get to a brand new AAA IP. And Horizon Zero Dawn is quite the new one for Sony and Guerrilla Games. The premise alone was enough to get me interested, as it takes place in a post-apocalyptic world set far in the future. So far, in fact, that humanity has regressed to tribal-like societies since the cataclysmic event, where robots now roam across the land, taking on animal-like characteristics. Playing as Aloy, you'll explore this captivating world, slowly uncovering how this all came to be, along with the mysteries behind Aloy herself. Being an open-world game, there are plenty of staples that you would expect from one, but are done in ways that reflect the world and Aloy's hunting skills like using a scanning device called a Focus to highlight enemies in their past, or primarily using bows and trap tools to take down machines. There are also plenty of things to do and come across, which gives some good rewards. Experience is earned to level up and unlock upgrade abilities with skill points, and materials you gather are used to craft ammo and carrying capacity upgrades, which are done in a way that doesn't feel like it needed to be included just for the sake of a game wanting a crafting system. This is a pretty extensive game that I feel I've only just sunk my teeth into. I still have a lot of the main game and the Frozen Wilds expansion to go through, but I'm hooked. It looks fantastic with its sci-fi nature aesthetic, the story and characters are well written, and taking on big bad machines are exhilarating fights. If you have a PlayStation 4 and enjoy open world games, then this is a must have. There is a complete edition if you haven't played it yet, it's what I got. Also being able to get the Aloy skin and bow in the PS4 version of Monster Hunter World was nice. Thanks for that Capcom. Number 2. Super Mario Odyssey As someone that really got into gaming thanks to Super Mario 64, Super Mario Odyssey was naturally my most wanted Nintendo Switch game. So when I got the system and this game, I did not regret it one bit. As the newest 3D Mario, it harkens back to the stage exploration style of 64 and Sunshine, only this time you collect moons. Lots and lots of moons. Fortunately, the collection process is streamlined to grab them as you go, with a few through main objectives, but most are gotten through scavenging the levels and completing numerous challenges. It's certainly the most collect-a-thon a Mario game has been to date, but as a fan of those types of games, it was very gratifying. Revolving around many of the moons is Mario's moveset, which is quite versatile in this game, especially with the new moves. Like being able to roll around, or more importantly, the ones from Cappy. Mario's ghost hat buddy that joins him after Bowser takes Peach, bops Mario away, and takes Cappy's sister for the tiara of the wedding he plans to have with Peach. And at least Bowser actually has a long-term plan behind just kidnapping the princess this time. Going back to Cappy's moves as Mario's hat, he is good as a throwing weapon or even as a makeshift platform to pull off some tricky jumps. But most importantly is his ability to possess, and it's such a good mechanic that blew people away when it was first revealed. Each enemy, creature, and object that can be possessed adds a whole new layer of how each area is played, and it's just plain fun in doing so. Even without possessing, the levels are a blast to run through, whether in the open areas or challenge rooms reminiscent of more linear levels like in the Galaxy games. There is just so much to this game. The clever 8-bit 2D sections, the fact there is no more lives and you only lose 10 coins and are set back a little when you die, the costumes you buy, of which a few are required to access rooms with moons, but for the most part are just for some dress-up fun, and the bosses, while pretty easy, are still inventive in their designs. I can't help but really be delighted by this game, and the colorful visuals and splendid music factored into it too. Although, I do admit that even a collectathon maniac like myself did start to get a tad burnt out when going towards 100%. I've taken a break on that, though I may end up going back to it in burst later on. Plus, while the motion controls may seem a little unnecessarily tacked on, I personally didn't mind them. Oh, and there was that update a while ago that added the Luigi Balloon mode, and it's... something to mess around with, I guess. And you're likely to run across balloons placed in areas you can't even get to. Yeah, that's real fair. Yeah, whatever, at least it's a free mode. 
Super Mario Odyssey not only continues my love for 3D Mario, but also single-handedly sold me on a Switch as a portable system when I was able to play this while in a waiting room. If that doesn't convince you on how much I like this game and the Switch, then I don't know what will. Number 1. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Predictable? Yeah, but you probably won't blame me. Taking the next Zelda game into a large and fully open free warming world was a very wise decision for Nintendo to do. And they made sure that exploring the vast kingdom of Hyrule will be worth your while. You do have your goal of stopping a calamity version of Ganon that already came about 100 years ago, with Link being revived with no memory, so you'll have to reclaim that and your power to defeat him. But it's everything else you come across along the way, piquing your curiosity to detour towards these discoveries. And there are many things you can do to make those possible. You can climb on most surfaces and glide within a stamina meter, use room powers from your Shiga slate to manipulate certain objects, cook health recovery dishes with food you gather, equip clothes and armor for defense, and wield an assortment of swords, shields, bows, spears, and other two-handed weapons to deal with foes. Of course, with the latter, weapon durability is a common complaint. And sure, as someone that likes to hoard items, it can be a hassle to manage, but it does encourage you to actually use them and be resourceful in finding more, which is never hard to do. The shrines are another big part of the game, acting as short puzzle trials spread throughout in order to get spirit ores for increasing Link's hearts and stamina wheel. As such, there is no dungeons in the traditional sense, with the shrines doing most of the puzzle solving. The closest are the Divine Beasts, which requires some manipulation to think outside the box a little, giving a new take on the dungeon aspect of Zelda games, even if there's only a few of them. Still, getting to each Divine Beast will be a joy to look at with the beautiful visuals and yeah, the frame rate does chug a little, especially back when it first launched, but it's only really noticeable in towns and forests, at least on the Wii U version, which is what I did get it on since I didn't have a Switch at launch. It plays fine on that in case you're wondering. The musical score is also quite nice, even if subdued. Whether it's the town themes, the light piano music when exploring, or kicking in when a boss fight starts. The only thing that is daunting with Breath of the Wild is, ironically, the size of it. Because in my main game, I haven't even completed 40% of the game. Though I believe that is mostly from all the Korok seeds I haven't gotten, which are nice moments of, aha, I knew it, when you see something out of place. But even though they do upgrade your weapon capacity slots, they don't really warrant getting them all. Even with the Korok mask from the DLC to find them easier. That aside, the rest of the DLC was good too, like the ridiculous but fun motorcycle, or the Trials of the Sword, which I still can't beat the last trial. That freaking Lyle just two-shots you and... Ugh. Though given the combat abilities of parrying with shields and dodging attacks at the right time to counter with the flurry barrage of your own, you can take on hard fights so long as you pull those off. And really, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what you can do in this game and what it has to offer. The different environments that affect you and need to counteract them, the memorable characters you meet, the fact that this is the first Zelda game with voice acted scenes that wasn't a bastard CDI child. I could keep going, but I do need to keep this at least somewhat short for a video like this. Is The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild a perfect game? Subjectively, you can say no. But it's still my personal favorite game of 2017, because it was one of the most fulfilling adventures I've had in a recent game. And there you go, that was my top 10 games of 2017. As late as it was, I hope you did at least enjoyed it. And feel free to discuss what your top 10 games back in 2017 were. Just, you know, try to be civil about it. I know that requests will likely fall on deaf ears given the nature of YouTube comments, especially on top 10 games videos, but let's at least try. And who knows, maybe I'll do a top 10 video on this year's best games, and maybe even get it out not as late. Maybe. We already have the new God of War and Monster Hunter World, which I have about, oh, over 200 hours in. So don't be surprised if you see this near the top. I'm kind of a fan of Monster Hunter in case you couldn't tell. But that's only a couple examples we have so far, and we still have upcoming releases like the new Smash Brothers, so we'll just have to wait and see. Until then, I'll see you all in the next video. Hey, thanks for watching. If you're new here, there really isn't any other top 10s yet, since this is my first one, but you can check out some of my other videos and subscribe if you are interested, as well as keep up to date with my Twitter and maybe even consider Patreon pledging for some bonuses too. All up to you, of course. See you all later.